Hello and welcome to Nursing Emergencies. This section is seizures. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's talk a little bit about seizures. Seizures are caused by having abnormal electrical activity that's occurring in the brain. And what happens is that we have this imbalance that's occurring between these two different pathways in the brain that's resulting in kind of an out of control electrical problem going on, kind of like an electrical storm that is happening in the brain. So let's blow this up a little bit and take a look at those pathways. We have the GABA pathway, that's the inhibitory pathway, and we have the glutamine pathway, which is the excitatory pathway. You notice that each one of these pathways here uses some of our electrolytes to be able to convey the message through that different pathway. So if there's an imbalance here, what we can end up with is too much excitation and not enough inhibition of the impulses, and then that can lead to the patient having these uncontrolled electrical impulses in the brain. As we take a look at some of the many causes for our patient developing a seizure, you can see that uh, infections and uh, intracranial abnormalities, such as encephalopathy, etc., tons of different reasons why people can develop seizures. I think most of us think of seizures as being a seizure disorder, such as somebody who has epileptic seizures. Some of the risk factors for developing seizures, and especially for patients who have a seizure disorder, we add these things on top of that seizure disorder, and we really put that patient in a position where they could be having a seizure while they're with us. So bleeding, infection, ischemia, gosh, this sounds like all of the patients you care for, right? When you look at that list. So we have to be watching for the possibility of seizures in many of our patients. If you take a look at the right there, there's an EEG, and it's illustrating on the left-hand side some normal brain-type activity, and then on the right-hand side, you can see we're having the seizure. And very similar to what you might expect if the patient was having maybe EKG abnormalities is we're having nice complexes that go into these big erratic-type complexes on the right. So kind of the same process in that we have this out of control electrical impulse that's occurring but this in this case instead of the heart it's the brain so seizure types are going to be dependent upon where they start we're going to label them also by the effects they have on awareness and by the symptoms so here's a list on the right of different kinds of seizures that our patient can have. You may notice that this list is a little different than the way you may have learned them in the past. And the reason for that is that there's been some changes that have occurred in the way that we're labeling seizures from maybe what we were calling them before, a petit mal and a generalized clonic tonic type of grand mal seizure. So let's start out with a small type of seizure. It's a, coming from one little area of the brain called a focal aware seizure. This was called in the past a simple partial seizure. Starts in one area of the brain. The patient's usually alert while this happens and remembers the seizure. So kind of an interesting thing. They may feel like they're fading away or they may feel like uh, they have some abnormal sensation or it may also present in the patient uh, having some kind of rhythmic motion of a part of their body. A focal impaired awareness seizure, so this is what we used to call a complex partial, is just a little bit different in that the awareness now is going to be impaired, so the patient may actually lose consciousness or the patient may just be confused. They may be able to hear you, but they can't respond. And this patient may have a postictal period. A postictal period is caused by the brain using up the glucose 
from that seizure. So all this electrical activity, all that electrical activity takes energy. So we need to use glucose to produce that energy to cause all that electrical activity. And then after that patient has had the seizure, they're going to have this period of time where there's not enough glucose to continue to have conscious type of brain function. A patient will uh, often go into maybe like a coma type state for a period of time until the brain has kind of normalized a little bit. So they may not remember the seizure at this point. The next one, and really when we're talking about any of these different kinds of seizures, it really depends upon what part of the brain is affected. So we can have half of the brain, a part of the brain, the entire brain. And just because a patient has had one type of seizure in the past does not mean that they have to have the same kind of seizure again in the future. Oftentimes we will have unusual feelings, smells, or tastes. I had one patient tell me that they thought that uh, there was an electrical fire in the room because they smelled something that smelled like maybe a socket or something shorting out, and they thought it was an electrical fire, when in fact it was this smell, this unusual smell that they were having prior to the seizure. Making a loud cry or a scream, we can have those repetitive movements of the body. That's the part that most people think of as being seizures, right, is that repetitive motion of the body. Visual disturbances, and it may spread from one hemisphere over to the entire brain. So even though it's starting on one side and you may see symptoms on one side, that may spread to the entire brain. And then we end up with a generalized onset seizure. So this is your clonic, tonic, grand mal kind of a seizure. Affecting the whole brain, we have loss of consciousness. There's usually amnesia that follows with it as well. Symptom-wise, we have the loss of consciousness, the body rigidity, the repeated contraction and relaxation of muscles. Now in this situation here, because of that contraction of muscles, the patient's also gonna be using up their glucose systemically. So this patient may have that postictal period and may last a lot longer because they're starting with less glucose in the periphery as well, not just in the brain. We may also have the loss of bowel or bladder control. Well, the one we really worry about here is the patient who has status epilepticus because this is the patient who may continue to have seizures to the point where the patient may end up having some anoxic brain injury. So we have large numbers of electrical bursts that are happening in the brain and the patient ends up with a sustained seizure that lasts longer than two minutes. So look at the diagnostic pieces on the bottom there. Two seizures 24 hours apart or one seizure in a 60% probability of reoccurrence within 10 years or diagnosis of epilepsy syndrome. So those are all risks and those are all ways that they would diagnose status elepticus in your patient. Another type of seizure is called the absence seizure, pettit mal. It's more common in children. The patient kind of has this unresponsive period where they may appear to be daydreaming. The eyelids may blink or the patient may just stare without blinking their eyes. Okay. Now you notice this one here, she looks like she's in school. She may just be bored <laughs> with what's going on in the classroom. That's an absence seizure. Prompt action. So what do we want to do for a patient with seizures? We want to take those seizure precautions. You know, the main thing here is we're trying to keep that patient from hurting themselves. So good management of the seizure, keeping the patient from hurting themselves, uh, making sure that the patient uh, doesn't vomit and aspirate. Provide those anti epilepticus so we can give the patient the medication to stop the seizure. Okay, that's going to be your benzodiazepams. And then the other medications are going to help to prevent the next seizure. And then there's the postictal care. Remembering again that the patient who is having this postictal phase may have a low blood sugar. So we want to be watching for the patient to possibly even have a bradycardia and respiratory arrest as a result of not having enough glucose getting to the brain to run those vital functions. So now let's take a look at our neuro
comparison chart here. We've talked about each one of these different problems. So let's walk on down through the list. We started out with our TIA. We said the lab test we're going to use for the TIA in stroke is going to be our CT scan. With the TIA, we're going to see a transient neurodeficit that is going to resolve. If it does not resolve, and in fact it evolves into a greater deficit, then the patient has a stroke. With a stroke, we have permanent symptoms and that could continue to evolve as the areas of the brain are becoming more injured. Sign of doom is going to be coma. Intracranial bleed, again, we're going to use the CT. In this case here, we may also use an MRA. Take a look at some of that vasculature. We're going to be looking for tachycardia and orthostatic hypotension as intracranial pressure starts to rise. If we see a progressive decrease in loss of consciousness, that is not a good sign indicating that we are getting additional bleeding. Increased intracranial pressure. Watch the systolic blood pressure. Okay, remember, systolic blood pressure is going to go up as intracranial pressure goes up, and we're going to use our CT scan. Symptom-wise, agitation, confusion, decreased level of consciousness, and we're looking for Cushing's triad as a sign of doom. Cushing's triad is, again, that systolic blood pressure is going up while the heart rate and the respiratory rate are going down. Remember, that reaches a point where the blood pressure starts to drop, too, and that's a critical point where the patient is decompensating. Lastly, we have our seizures. The lab test is going to be the EEG. The symptoms are a decreased level of consciousness, clonic tonic movements. Okay, again, we're talking about that clonic tonic type of seizure. Respiratory distress and cardiovascular collapse, and those could also occur even into the postictal phase. So this is what we were talking about before with Cushing's triad. You see that systolic blood pressure going up with an increase in our pulse pressure, while at the same time the pulse and the respiration, so we have bradycardia and we're decreasing our respiration rate at the same time. So as the intracranial pressure is going up, we're seeing pulse and respiration go down while the blood pressure is going up. Interesting phenomena. The blood pressure is going up because... The intracranial pressure is going up, so the brain saying, hey, we need more blood pressure up here and more perfusion, so it's stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. Remember that there's baroreceptors elsewhere in the body, like the carotid bodies and the aortic arch, and so those areas are also sensing and saying, hey, what's with all this blood pressure? And so they're stimulating the parasympathetic system, and that's dropping the pulse and the respiration. We also have our neuro quick check. Okay, make sure you watch that video as well, where we're able to be able to tell what our patient is doing very quickly by just coming in and doing this five point neuro check, looking for the best neuro possibility here, which would be a change in behavior. That's gonna happen first. Then we're gonna see problems with speech, then content of arousability. This is the thing that most people like to call orientation. And then we move down to arousal, and finally, the systolic blood pressure. When that patient is unconscious, the best indicator you have is watching the systolic blood pressure because it has to go up as intracranial pressure goes up. Well, thank you for joining me for Nursing Emergencies Seizures. This is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.